Welcome back, everybody, to the Parenting and Work in a Post-COVID Context Conference. For those of you who have just joined the conference for this session, welcome. Uh, our next panel is entitled The Equality Conundrum, which refers broadly to the conundrum of what gender equality entails, but in particular to the conundrum of who cares in contemporary Australian families and how care work is related to gender inequality. We're joined by three ANU scholars, Emeritus Professor Marion Saw, Professor Lyndall Strasdens, and Dr. Anne McDuff. Each speaker will speak for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll have about half an hour for questions and discussion at the end. So please feel free to put your questions or comments or contribute to the conversation using the Q&A function. And feel free to do that during the sessions. I'll keep an eye on it during the presentation. Sorry, I can keep an eye on it and then put the questions to the speakers at the end of the session. So to begin our panel today, I would like to welcome Emeritus Professor Marion Saw from the ANU School of Politics and International Relations. And the title of Professor Saw's paper is Equality Starting at Home. Over to you, Marion. First, let me join uh, the other ANU contributors to the conference in, in um, paying my respects to the Nambri and Ngunnawal elders, past, present and emerging. And let me also thank Emma and, and Margaret for organising such a wonderful, wonderful conference with so, top, so topical and, and such uh, stimulating presentations of, of data and, and questions, policy questions. My paper's about the uh, place of the distribution of unpaid work in gender equality policy. It's uh, long been recognised that the gender division of labour and particularly the performance of unpaid and poorly played care work by women is at the heart of gender inequality. Uh, some have thought that the COVID pandemic and associated lockdowns, meaning that both men and women were working from home and in the home, might um, provide an opportunity for a different division of unpaid household and care work. Uh, for example, the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency has said, men's engagement in flexible work during the pandemic has the potential to change gender norms at work and at home for good. However, while there is evidence that the pandemic has generated much more acceptance and demand for flexible work, the impact on the gender division of work and care is less clear. To adequately address underlying structural issues such as the division of unpaid work, there needs to be a comprehensive national gender equality policy with uh, serious accountability measures and reporting. Australia lacks such a policy despite having national plans in areas such as violence against women and women peace and security, as well as the uh, women's economic security statement. Um, lip service is paid, of course, to um, to, to gender inequality being the uh, underlying factor responsible for uh, phenomena such as violence against women. But um, it's not seriously, uh, the issues such as that are not seriously embedded in, a, in, a, in an overarching gender equality policy. Um, the um, shift away from domestic gender equality policy, apart from violence against women and women's labour force participation rates, is common to a number of comparable countries, and I've written about that elsewhere. This paper compares the policy recognition given to the gender division of unpaid work in Australia and Sweden, drawing on... on um, material from the CEDAW reporting process, uh, which is, you know, a wonderful resource if you want to look at how governments construe uh, gender equality. 
It also looks at uh, material relating to ILO 156 adopted in 1981, which is the um, international convention most directly relevant to changing the distribution of unpaid work. The convention cites CEDAW on the need to change the traditional role of men, and the convention aims to create effective equality of opportunity between men and women workers with family responsibilities, requiring that flexible work arrangements be equally, equally available for them. So the goal is to enable men to take a more equal role in unpaid work. So in comparing policy issues relating to the distribution of unpaid work in Australia and in Sweden, this paper looks at the design of parental leave and the monitoring of distribution of unpaid work through national time use surveys does not cover another very relevant issue, which is, of course, childcare. Temi, could we have the first slide now? The first substantive slide? Thank you. So, as you can see here, Sweden has an overarching gender equality policy. Um, it has a government that calls itself a feminist government and it reproduces its uh, gender equality policy widely in official policy documents. It has six sub goals and sub goal four is an equal distribution of unpaid work and care. By contrast, Australia has no overarching gender equality policy now and has no sub goal on the distribution of unpaid work. Unpaid work is, is uh, discussed in, in numerous policy documents, but as a problem for the labour force participation of women and for economic productivity, not for gender equality. Kemi, could we have the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. So here we're looking at policy responses to the issue of, of um, the distribution of unpaid work and care and its sharing between men and women. So in uh, 1974, Sweden became the first country in the world to have a um, so-called gender neutral uh, policy uh, relating to uh, parental leave. So instead of having matern maternity leave, having parental leave six months change, uh, six months transmissible between parents. Um, so could be shared between parents at six months. Subsequent to 1974, there are gradual increases in length um, of, of the parental leave care, but otherwise it remained transmissible between parents. In 1982, a year after the adoption of ILO 156 on um, equal opportunity for, for parents with family responsibility, for, the, for workers with family responsibilities, Sweden ratified. Uh, and we'll see there's a bit of a contrast with Australia. So that was important, uh, um, adopting the convention which promotes flexible working conditions for both male and female parents. In um, 1989, um, the parental leave was extended to 15 months and soon became 16 months. Um, but still, it wasn't being taken uh, by, by men on the whole. Fathers were not taking advantage of the um, transmissible parental leave. Um, so what we find is that um, in 1995, the first uh, daddy leave was introduced. Again, Sweden was leading the world with daddy leave, um, which uh, was not transmissible and was on a use it or, or lose it basis. So um, fathers were being uh, encouraged into uh, greater sharing of, of caring 
responsibilities in the home and daddy leave gets extended to two months and then three months in 2016, that's 90 days. So um, at the same time, in terms of, of monitoring what's going on, uh, Sweden introduced its first uh, time use, national time use survey in 1991. Uh, Temi, could we have the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. So Australia, a bit different. Um, uh, didn't manage to ratify ILO 156 until 1990. Um, despite a big campaign going on within government led by the uh, Office of Status of Women in, um, in, in combination with feminists in the Labour Party and in the ACTU, um, the Labour government had been elected in 1983 with a commitment to ratify, but it took um, it, it it took seven years to to do so um, because of fears by a couple of jurisdictions that it would lead to increased um, paid leave entitlements for workers. Uh, so in 1992, Australia conducted its first full-scale time use survey, repeated 97, 2006, and then not till 2020. Um, Australia was also a laggard in terms of providing parental leave, didn't happen till 2011, despite years and years of campaigning, both from within government and from outside. And it was uh, not generous in any respect, 18 weeks uh, at the minimum wage. Uh, two, year, two years later, there was two weeks daddy leave uh, introduced, but um, it was on, a, on that use it or lose it basis, but it was not designed really to uh, encourage uh, fathers to take it up. Um, it was like paid parental leave in Australia at the, at the um, minimum rate of minimum wage, and it was complicated to apply for, and it was very short. So um, uh, policy design was not such as to really promote the um, to promote gender equal parenting and the sharing of household work and care. Um, Kemi, could we have the next slide, please? This is just to indicate part of the campaign being promoted by the Office of Status of Women. Uh, Joe Average in 1983, who um, uh, was a family man and therefore shared the responsibility for housework and caring for the kids. There was a Swedish equivalent at this stage, but I haven't been able to find it. It was um, a beautiful poster of a um, of a Swedish wrestler cradling a baby in his arms, and this was a poster that went up in the metro in Stockholm and so on. Um, so uh, similar similar um, campaigns being waged in the two countries to promote uh, to promote greater sharing of unpaid work and care. And uh, when when Australia finally ratified the ILO Convention 156. Uh, the Work and Family Unit was established in the Industrial Relations Portfolio to promote gender neutral, flexible work practices. Um, unfortunately, they, as Margaret has said today, they uh, flexibility in work is, is mainly remain identified with women and a bit stigmatizing for men. Um, and unfortunately, of course, the work and family unit disappeared during the uh, Howard government years in 2004. Temi, could we have the next slide? Thank you. So um, Sweden has serious indicators of progress on its, sub its gender equality sub goal four um, on the distribution of unpaid work. So those are take up of parental leave, time spent on housework, um, obviously disaggregated by sex and the percentage of women and men who work part-time due to the care of dependents. 
So um, those indicators are reported against um, annually by the uh, Swedish Bureau, Statistical Bureau. Could we have the next slide, please? So what does Australia do? Um, doesn't have a gender equality policy, so it doesn't have uh, indicators monitoring progress in, in uh, implementing its gender equality policy, but it does have gender indicators, uh, which um, uh, have been posted by the ABS um, and uh, are described as, as relating to domains relevant to uh, gender equality concerns. So not to specific goals of a, of a gender equality policy, but to gender equality concerns. And they include take up of parental leave and time use, um, which of course in, have shown that women take uh, the vast majority of parental leave. Um, and in 2006, the last the time of the last time use survey, women spent twice as long as on unpaid work as did men. So um, these gender indicators um, did not appear last year. Uh, at first they appeared twice a year, then once a year, and last year they didn't appear at all pending a review um, uh, of user, user, user uh, demands or user needs for, for, for this data. Okay, so um, if we can go on to the next slide, Temi. Sorry, thank you. So the policy design uh, in Australia is very limited in terms of any encouragement of um, more equal distribution of unpaid work and care. Um, it's mainly designed to support women's workforce participation. At first, it was completely inflexible and had to be taken in a single block. So clearly, if a, a woman took parental leave after childbirth, she then had to take the whole block um, and it couldn't really be passed on to a, a partner uh, uh, after a certain number of weeks. So there's more flexibility now from, from 2020, but it's still too short and uh, the minimum wage rate is insufficient to encourage male take up. Uh, could we have the next slide? Thanks, Timmy. I know I must learn how to do this myself. Um, so policy outcomes, um, Australian women do 50% more unpaid work than Swedish women. Uh, that means um, Australian women do about two hours more unpaid work a day than men. Uh, whereas on average in Sweden, uh, women do uh, uh, about one more day, one more hour a day uh, than men of unpaid work. Uh, in terms of um, the take up of, of paid parental leave, Swedish men take up 30% of paid parental leave. Australian men uh, about was about 5%, but the Workplace Gender Equality Agency uh, scorecard released yesterday suggests that they're now taking up about 12%. So that is a, a, a big increase, which is interesting. Um, could we have the next slide? Thank you. So um, where, where do we need to go from here? Um, Non-government organisations put in shadow reports to, to, to the CEDAW committee uh, on their government's implementation of gender equality policy. The Swedish Women's Lobby um, and the Swedish CEDAW network are calling for wholly individualised and non-transferable parental leave um, at, at the moment in Sweden, uh, as I've said, um, both partners have 90 days which are not which are not uh, transmissible but the rest of the 16 months can be transferred 
in Australia, organisations also are calling for equal non-transferable and flexible leaves. Parents at Work is one such organisation, whereas um, the Equality Rights Alliance have a somewhat more modest call to extend paid parental leave and the dad and partner leave. <laughs> I mean, clearly what would probably be better would be not to have a distinction between primary and secondary care leave, but to have a single system of parental leave, um, which attached to individuals rather than uh, being up for sharing. Um, so just if we can finish with the last um, slides, Timmy. Uh, this issue has been pretty much on the uh, agenda recently, um, outside government anyway, and the splendid reports have been published last year uh, calling for uh, a design of our paid parental leave which would encourage a greater sharing by, by, by men. And you can see the cover images here and on, this is the Grattan Institute Dad Days, and could we have the next one, Timmy? Thank you. And this is KPMG, uh, their, um, their take on, on what would, what would uh, increase father's participation in household and unpaid care. Um, so just to finish with the conclusion, Temi, the next slide. Has COVID indeed created a policy window for changes to the division of household and care work? There is now widespread support for flexible work, but I would suggest that the lack of policies to promote more equal sharing of unpaid work and care means that we're likely to continue with the uh, current very, very unequal distribution of, of um, work and unpaid work and care, and hence uh, the continuation of gender inequality overall. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Marion, for that wonderful presentation um, and for allowing us to look at our gender inequality in Australia from a historical perspective, but also within a comparative framework and, you know, drawing our attention to the need for an overarching national policy that can address the undervaluation and um, unequal distribution of unpaid care. Um, I would now like to welcome our next speaker for our Equality Conundrum panel, Professor Lyndall Strasdens from the ANU Research School of Population Health. And Professor Strasdens' paper is entitled Equal Pay for Equal Care, Gender Equality and the Case for Reducing Work Hours. Thank you, Lyndall. Sorry. Uh I'm muted. Uh, thanks also, uh, Marion, for that really interesting talk on the comparisons. I'm just going to share my screen. I also would like to uh, thank uh, and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land that I'm uh, speaking from, which is the Gambri and Gunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present. According to the World Economic Forum, gender parity went backwards in 2020. Like many countries, our progress towards parity is also stalling. Um, we're about 50, ranked 50 out of 150 countries by the World Economic Forum. We dropped nine places. And an Australian girl born today will earn about 14 cents less for every dollar her brother earns. And if we count all remuneration, she'll actually get paid about 20 cents less than him for every dollar she earns. And we've closed the gender gap in education and in health, but not in employment, and the question is why. So today I'm going to advance the idea that this pay gap is linked to a time gap, which is linked to a care gap, which is due to a problem in how we understand work. And I wanna take you through my argument for this and why I think um, we need to uh, think about equal pay once we achieve equal time. So here's the problem, and it's pretty universal. The top slide is OECD countries. Actually, this looks even worse when you look in the um, developing worlds. So men do more pay, paid work than women. The orange bars are unpaid work, and the little blue dot 
um, is the men's contribution versus the orange bar women. Uh, women, uh, men do more paid work than women, and this delivers them an advantage in power and their earnings, and women do more of the unpaid work, let me call that care work, than men, and this hampers their time for paid work and access to power and earnings. So in Australia, it's two times, men do two times the amount of paid work, women do about two times the amount of childcare, 59 versus 22 minutes a day. It's, it is changing, although very slowly. And uh, so we're seeing a very small increase in the number of fathers uh, taking flexible care. The percentage of the fathers working from home has doubled from 7% to 14%, but it's a slow change. So what is the answer? Should we be targeting a gender equality policy at helping women do more paid work, which is largely where it's sitting, or should we be helping men do more care? Or perhaps, everyone should just do less care, as the father of six, Premier Perite, suggested yesterday when he called for revolutionary ideas to break down structural gender barriers. He said 9am until 3pm doesn't work. And the ABC article that reported on this notes that the school day is antiquated and was set in 1818, but then so was our work week. Because in 1907, 1907, the Harvester decision was where Justice Higgins and the Arbitration Court decided that seven shillings a day or 42 shillings a week was the fair and reasonable wage for an unskilled labourer. This, this became the basis of a national minimum wage and it was a living or family wage because it understood that there was a man who would go into the labour market to earn money and a woman whose time at home would enable him to do so. It decided not just how much people were paid, though, it decided who was paid and how long they worked. And it was based on this assumption that there was a trade of time. And it was based also on a history of a labour market that was almost entirely male. And that this, um, and that men were able to spend more long hours in the job because women would help them at home. But there's another problem of time which intersects with this. Um, so we were, we were actually one of the, at that time, we were one of the first countries um, to understand not only to set a minimum wage, but also to set a standard working week of eight hours. And so this was the banner that we worked, worked, worked walked under and worked under uh, in 1860, demanding the right for an eight hour stay. And so we had um, actually in this country, as well as the harvest decision, um, we had another process where we set up what the working day looked like and it was to divide 24 hours into eight hours for work and eight hours for rest and re eight hours for recreation. And of course, the problem with that is they left something off, but we only have 24 hours. So if the harvest decision was ever a problem um, uh, for, for women back there, it is certainly a problem for women right now. So this is um, an example. This is the labour market in 50 years ago. And this is the labour market. Well, this is the most recent graph I can get that shows these side by side. Um, so 10 years ago. And what you can see, it, it is radically transformed. We have an outdated understanding of what work looks like. We have an outdated understanding of what a work day looks like. So what's happened is that rather than women join the labour market and drop that all that time they're spending in the home to support participation in the labour market, they added it on. So this is a graph from Hilda data. Um, it's just using their time time use survey estimates and what it shows. Can you see the little cursor? Okay, can you see it? It's showing up on the screen. Okay, is it showing up on that screen? Okay, it's weird, I have to use the other screen. Okay, so this is showing women who are not in the labor force, women who are working part-time and women who are working full-time. And just simply that's paid work, the dark, the middle is, is um, the unpaid work, domestic work, and this is just actual caregiving. And what you see is that when women enter the labor market, they don't um, cut back, they just do more. So what women have done is they've moved into the labour market in that transformation from an almost entirely male labour market to an almost gender equal balanced labour market. 
is that they've replaced the inequality and exclusion with time pressure. So between 74 to 85% of women are always feeling rushed and pressed for time. Or they work part-time and abandon equality for feasibility and sanity. It's not just a problem for women. Actually, our work with fathers is showing it's a problem for them. 25% of Australian fathers work weekends. More than half are saying they're missing important family events. 20% are saying their time when they do have it with their families is pressured. 35% of their children are saying their fathers are working too much and 34% would like more time with him. We forget children's voices in this debate and they are so important. And there's one more thing, which is our health, because actually having enough time for health is critical. We are facing enormous chronic disease threats. Uh, the pandemic actually is a huge health threat, but the people who are most vulnerable to it have chronic disease burdens most often. And lack of time is the number one reason why people are saying they cannot do the things that they need just to stay healthy. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of an hourglass ceiling, which is a concept I've been thinking about for quite a few years now. And it's an attempt to try and understand the problem of gender inequality in employment through a time lens. The hourglass ceiling, as I think about it, is this idea of a ceiling on women's pay, career choice and advancement, which is not based on their merit, but based on their time. And because of that, it's pushing women from the long hour, well-paid, high-powered, senior type roles to shorter hour jobs, which are almost uh, uh, entirely um, either less likely to advance or less likely to offer them good paying conditions. What this is doing is it's creating a, a two-tiered labour market, and that's locking in gender inequality. So women have moved into the labour market, but it's moved half into a labour market, a labour market that still is designed to meet, meet a long hour, woman-supported working week. So, and women's only option is to enter it in a half way. And I'll just take you through very briefly a bit of research to show why I think this is so important and so locked in. So this is a piece of work uh, which was um, published, I'm afraid to say, in 2017. And the pandemic not only skittled a whole lot of things, it skittled my research. So I do have some updated figures where we've done this with Germany, but today I'll just present Australian data. It, and we have actually rerun it more on the most recent Hilda Wave. It's pretty much exactly the same. This is what we did when we looked at the um, Australian labour market as represented in Hilda. And uh, uh, if Liz Allen's here, she'll be definitely thinking benchmark here, um, where we averaged over everybody. So we're not taking into account many differences. And we went, all right, so what is the point at which work hours, working is good for people and working is not so good for people? And we did something really different with this analysis. We actually modelled a whole system of working, not just work hours and health. We actually modelled a whole system to into account money and a whole range of other things, including household behaviours. So this is better mental health, worse mental health. And what we that, that, that curve means, on average, people's work mental health improves. And we know that work is good for people up to a point. And the point is around 39 hours a week. And it starts to go down. Oops, sorry. But we then cut the sample by gender, men and women. And we start to see quite a different picture. So when you look at the threshold for women, which is this dotted line, you see they get a benefit from working for sure, but they have a tipping point of around 34 hours a week and a decline in their mental health straight afterwards. We've done this actually for physical health and alarmingly for BMI as well. Um, and then this is men's curve. It's a little bit flatter and it doesn't tip down as much. And they, their tipping point is around 46 hours a week. That constitutes um, nearly um, a 13 hour advantage every single week 
on average for a man to work before he would compromise his mental health compared to a woman. It's a pretty good reason why pay gaps haven't changed and why women's work hours haven't increased. All right, so what about um, if we just, all right, forget gender, let's just look at care and domestic work. So we just cut the sample by relatively high versus relatively low care and domestic work. And I guess none of you are surprised to see that, well, what happens is that the thresholds look pretty much the same. People who are doing more care and domestic work, 34 hours a week, is good, up and then down it goes. People who aren't, 46 hours a week is fine. Well, of course, we could all work and not care. That is a vision of society. It's certainly been the way we've understood working in terms of paid work. And it's certainly been the way we've designed what a working week looks like and what our industrial relations system is. So if we don't have anyone with care in the sample, women and men can work 46 to 49 hours a week. Not a problem. It makes very little difference to their mental health, how long they're working. And when we test for that difference, it's not significant. It's the same. Of course, if men care, and I will say in a sample, even though we did try and cut it into men who have high care, they were, their care levels and domestic work levels were never the same as women, then their threshold drops down. So what that means is for men to pick up more care work, while other men are able to work 46 hours a week, they're suffering a time disadvantage, not as wide, but somewhat as wide as women, a disincentive for men to do more because they can't because of course they reach a ceiling like women have and they start to then pay other costs like their health. So um, Emma, I actually can't see the time on my, my screen. Have I got five more minutes? You do, yep. Okay, one of the problems with being a researcher interested in time is um, <laughs> it can escape me. So I'm just going to do a little thought experiment about why work time is so critical. So this is the Australian labor market. It's actually an old slide from the OECD, but they have stopped breaking them down nicely. But what you can see that the, the, the light gray bars are the women and the dark black bars are men. And you can see it's kind of spread out. So you see a kind of thing where men are at one end, the long hours up here, and women are down, it's like a flat thing. That's Finland which does a lot better than us on gender equality. Um, and what you see, and they have a very high rate of workforce participation of women, is that women and men are actually almost all clustered here. Very little tail here and very little tail here. And of course, this is Japan. So Japan, of course, as you would all know, has suffering a major demographic crisis. Uh, women are voting with their babies very, very low plummeting fertility rates and an, an appalling gender equality um, uh, rating. And what you see is the average work hours in Japan are closer to 50. So if you do want to have a job, you're way up here. And so what this graph doesn't show you is a large number of women who are either working down, just not working at all, excluded entirely. So this is just a little thought experiment. We've got some um, time use data from the OECD. There's a few rough bits in that data set, but let's just um, accept that it's helpful. Here's Finnish men and women. That's the, the purple is their paid time, their unpaid time, still the gender imbalance in Finland, like everywhere else. Here's Japan, enormous uh, work hours for men, short ones for women. And if, if Japan, for example, was just to get women to work more, which is what is actually part of their gender equality um, thing, this is what that would look like if you didn't change unpaid time. It's impossible. It's certainly not equal. It's no one's vision of gender equality. Um, this is what it would look like if you just made men do the same amount of unpaid work as women somehow. Still not a feasible solution. But this is what would look like if you reform the labour market. So let's have a look at us against Finland. Uh, 
Marion, I'm sorry I don't have Sweden. <laughs> that would have been really interesting. Um, so there's Finland again. There we are. Um, so men are doing more paid work relative to Finnish men, women less relative to Finnish women, and more unpaid work. Let's see what will happen. So let's get all Australian women to work like men do, um, but not change this at all. So not really a vision of equality. Let's make men and women do more, uh, or men do more unpaid work, still really quite a lot higher in terms of hours per day to Finland. And I'm not saying Finland's got it nailed here, but what if we were to actually start to bring our workhouse down equally to around a 38 hour week? Which brings me to the ACT inquiry into the future of working week, which is really a very fascinating um, initiative which has come up. Um, it, submissions will close February the 28th, so pretty soon. And it's inquiring into defining and configuring the concept of a four day working week and its advantages, disadvantages, the options, how it might work, um, how it compares with other alternatives, holiday relatedness. I think this conference should try and put in a collective submission. I am putting one in. I really think what we need is a new harvester. I really do. I think it's time. 1907, no. It's time to actually revisit in our industrial relations how we think about how to divide up our days. So it's gender fair and it's family kind. But that's a big jump. So I'm wondering whether we could consider just a work our baby step. What if we just, in the meantime, simply started to limit the hours work past our national employment standard of 38 hours a week? Iceland recently trialled the reduced hour working week and what they found was it worked best when you did it in steps, increment by increment. So what will it be like if we just simply said we have a national employment standard of 38 hour weeks, which at least one quarter of our labour market works beyond. In fact, one in eight employed Australians work longer than 50 hours. It's extraordinary when you think about that as a national employment standard. It's violation of that standard on a mass scale. Couldn't we just enforce that? It's already there. So um, I think, I hope I have not um, used up too much time, but maybe I'll stop there. Thank you, Lyndall. You're perfectly on time for a time scholar. In fact, you're one minute early. So <laughs> there you go. Um, thank you. That's very thought provoking. Um, and it's actually quite disturbing to look at some of those um, charts and think about, you know, it's so clear then the intersection between care work, our paid work and our health, which I guess is an aspect we don't hear as much about. So thank you. Um, and I'd now like to move on to our final speaker and welcome Dr. Anne McDuff from the ANU College of Law. And Dr. McDuff's paper is entitled Sharing Care During a Pandemic, Gender, Post-Separation Parenting and Family Law in Australia. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Marianne and Lyndall for your fabulous papers. I look forward to the questions at the end. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so like others, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, Indigenous custodians of the land upon which I live, work and walk, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people, their elders past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I'd also like to make a note just before I start that um, I've realised this presentation is largely about benchmark mothers or white heterosexual middle class mothers and doesn't speak to the diversity of perspectives from diverse families, well, at least as much as it should. Um, but I'd like to think that this presentation is the first of future research um, in identifying the operation of gendered parenting norms uh, that circulate in family law and I hope to explore um, these norms as they apply to our diverse forms of families in Australia at some time in the future. 
So um, we've been talking a bit in this panel already about the gendered burden of unpaid care work that the COVID health measures have placed on parents. Um, and that too is the focus of my presentation today. Um, I've adopted the definition of care work used by the Workplace Gender Equality Agents, see meaning um, labour that underpins looking after children and it, it includes homeschooling, house management, shopping, cleaning and washing. Although as a side note, and I was thinking after the Commissioner June Oscar was speaking this morning, that perhaps that's a fairly minimal definition and perhaps others have looked at this, it only just occurred to me this morning. And then it doesn't yet include um, a broader definition of culture caring and community care that perhaps it should, but uh, maybe I'll have to uh, include that later. Um, and I'll also caution um, that I do, because I'm using and drawing upon the survey data that use these terms, um, my analysis and findings are in the language of very gendered language as well. It talks about men and women, mothers and fathers, although I'd just like to acknowledge that I don't necessarily, uh, these are terms with cultural uh, uh, circulation and, and meaning, but they don't necessarily, for me at least, mean any particular thing. I think they're shifting and can mean other things. Um, so onto the sort of real crux of my presentation, which is that um, around the unequal distribution of care work. Um, and I wanted to argue that it's, for me at least, the, the, that it's the invisibility of care work and its gendered inequality and the social consequences that it has that um, preoccupies me at the moment. And in this paper, I'll argue that it's the invisibility of care work that leaves unchallenged gendered parenting norms. And um, I'll argue that these norms of mothering and fathering in the ways in the ways that they're gendered um, circulate in the application of family law. And that has a potential to very negatively impact on mothers post-separation. So my paper starts by highlighting some women's experiences of shared parenting and unequal care during the pandemic. Um, then I'll explain how care work has is largely invisible uh, under our legislative regime in the Australian Family Law Act. And then I'll finish with discussing a case that I hope will bring out clearly some of the implications of invi the invisibility of care work and its gendered parenting norms as they operate in family law disputes. Um, so starting first with the experiences of shared parenting and unequal care, um, I was lucky enough to be a member of Professor Thornton's research team that put together the anonymous survey on the impact of health measures and work life on work and home life. And as Professor Thornton has already mentioned, this anonymous survey was distributed in Australia um, in around May to September 2020 during the national lockdown. Of the 220 people who responded, um, 132 reported that in that time frame, they shared the care of dependent children while carrying out work from home. And this is the subset of the responses that I, I, look, um, I zone, zoomed in on. The experiences communicated through the survey in the form of answers to multiple choice and open-ended questions demonstrate um, a lot of things, including the blurring of the public and private and its gendered impact, which is what um, Professor Thornton has already spoke about. But I was interested in looking at particularly how mothers were describing their experiences of shared care of children during lockdown. Um, and I'll note, I thought it was interesting that at least seven of the respondents, not many perhaps quantitatively, but this was, their responses were offered unprompted um, about um, what they meant by, or what they understood to mean by shared care. Um, and it probably won't surprise anyone that shared care did not necessarily mean uh, equality. And I think these two quotes are representative of um, what they were saying. And I'll read the first one, the second one's a bit short. So while household and childcare work is shared, I do all of the emotional work with children and family members, taking care of all the fights, crying children, lonely grandparents, etc. I also take care of organising access to food, including hours and hours of research on where to obtain food safely, rationing decisions, purchasing, purchasing decisions and menu decisions. So these comments, and there were others, mirror decades of data, which we've also heard about so far today, about Australian households and um, 
how with the, despite the increased participation or perhaps because of it, uh, of women in the paid workforce, women are still largely responsible for the unpaid care work in the home. What was also interesting, I thought, in these surveys was that the female respondents described the impact of their unpaid care work on their paid work. So this was kind of the perfect COVID storm. Many explained that since they were the parent that knew what children needed, when and where their things were, um, their working lives during lockdown were more interrupted than it was for their male partners. And of course, there are perhaps there are other uh, explanations and circumstances and factors that go into the interruptibility of women in the home while they're working. But um, I wanted to just focus on um, the uh, underpinning theme about their role in the home, which made them more interruptible. So, which they were explaining made them more interruptible. And I really love this, I find this first quote really wonderful, it's striking. And it goes, although my partner and I were working from home, I am the go-to parent for my kids. Can I have a snack? Are there any clean socks? Where's the link for my violin lesson? Who is Gough Whitlam? It's easy enough to do admin under circumstances, but while I'm trying to write a book at the moment and deep concentration is quite hard to muster under these circumstances, it's been very frustrating. Um, so, but, and before moving on, I just want to briefly consider if shared and unequal, what shared but unequal parenting might mean. Um, so if we shared parenting, but it doesn't include care work, what does parenting now look like? Um, it seems to me that what is left, and this is perhaps um, what uh, is socially acceptable maybe or a norm about what fathers contribute, is that the parenting decision, parenting is seen as decision making and spending time with children outside work. Um, and I wrote that and earlier today Liz Allen um, mentioned something and I thought that what I've, this theme in, in in the data resonates with what she said, which was that mothers seem to fit work around caring and fathers fit caring around work. And I think this data reflects that. Um, and interestingly enough, there are a couple of comments in the survey data which talk about how, how fathers were being involved in home life during COVID. And it's not, there's not very much, it's not statistically sort of uh, I can't say representative, but it was interesting because most of the comments were around physical activity, bike riding, playing outside, um, were the things that were typically mentioned. And um, if that's the case, then we can see how um, these parenting activities, uh, as seen as shared parenting, interfere less with the ideal work norm um, and where the worker is unencumbered and uninterrupted by caring responsibilities. So it's certainly the case that if this shared parenting, if it includes decision making and spending time, does represent a change um, in the traditional father norms, away from the traditional father norms of the largely absent authoritarian head of household figure whose main responsibility was to be the breadwinner and main income earner. Um, however, if I'd suggest that if care work continues to be both invisible and largely done by women and therefore feminised, then what's understood as shared parenting instead better reflects the norms of inclusive fatherhood, which interestingly is still being expressed broadly in terms of control and presence. So far from challenging the gendered norms of parenting about motherhood and fatherhood, narratives of shared parenting obscure and reinforce the double under a uh, double standard that's operating within it. And I, uh, it was timely, but um, if you're on Instagram and you can have a look at these mum life, I think these are the, illustrate some of the double standards quite neatly in a short image um, uh, so you can have a look at. Um, but of, uh, my view is that gendered parenting not harms, norms harm not just mothers, but fathers too, um, and also diverse family forms. Any actual person who, for various reasons, can't or doesn't want to fit within these um, quite rigid gender norms. So, I now like to take what I've this what I think is some interesting data and look at how that plays out in a family law context, particularly in family law disputes. And I'll start just by um, noting that 
um, care work is invisible, I would argue, in the Family Law Act. The Family Law Act provides a legislative framework for resolving family law disputes, and it includes making orders, uh, parenting orders, which are largely uh, framed in the terms uh, parental, about parental responsibility, where the children live and who the children spend time with. Um, I don't have time to go into why I think it's invisible, um, but largely it's because of the changes in 2006 which were introduced, which largely focus on the importance of a meaningful uh, relationship with both parents. Um, so that's, that's one part of it. Um, there is one place in the Family Law Act where the experience of care work and the knowledge and understanding that it brings and assists in parenting may become relevant. Um, and that's in a subsection called capacity of the parents, uh, capacity, um, sorry, uh, capacity to meet the needs of the child. And that can apply to a parent or any other caregiver uh, who's involved in the family law dispute. However, at the moment, the way it's placed in the context of the best interests of the child test, what happens is it rarely carries, it rarely outweighs the benefit of a meaningful relationship with um, both parents. And it's also uh, applied in a prospective way. So uh, even if a parent hasn't ha uh, been able to demonstrate a capacity to meet the needs of the child in the past, provided that they can demonstrate or or argue or provide evidence that they will in the future, um, that's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a bar for them to um, have uh, shared parental responsibility and or ha have the children live with them. So my conclusion about the Family Law Act is just like in the marketplace, care work um, seems to be largely invisible. And as, as Margaret has already mentioned, uh, counts for nothing. So uh, it, that legal analysis was a bit truncated, so apologies. Hopefully I've said enough to give you a sense of what's in the legislative framework. I'd now like to turn to how it's been applied um, and particularly um, how the invisibility of care work allows judicial officers to reconstruct claims made by mothers um, often made on, based on concerns about a child's medical and educational needs as being anti-father. And this issue seems to be particularly invisible in cases heard in the family courts during the pandemic, um, as the health, education and support of children becomes, if not the most pressing issue for all parents, um, including separated ones. So uh, I'll just note that I'm still reviewing all the cases on the COVID-19 list um, set up by the family courts in 2020. Um, and I'm just going to select one case to discuss that I think illustrates the themes that I've been, the invisibility of care work um, and it's gen uh, the gendered parenting norms and its implications uh, in the context of family law disputes. And I'd also like to say that I'm not necessarily arguing that the case was uh, the outcome of the case was incorrect or that the law was um, improperly um, applied. Uh, family law cases involve a complex mix of facts which can't always be appreciated um, by a reader of the judgment. Uh, the judgment doesn't allow us to assess the either the credibility of the parties or the nuance of the evidence um, as would be, have been the case if you'd been able to listen to the oral testimony, the full oral testimony of both parties. So it's, the judgment is really a snapshot and an explanation of the judge's reasoning. However, um, it's still important to do because I think there are some unusual and striking comments in the reasoning, particularly in this case, um, which while they have no precedential value, so it's not going to constrain future cases, what it does what it is now is part of our public record and it illustrates the significance and implications of the invisibility of um, care work in family law. So the case I'm going to talk about was mentioned here is Chaucer and Chaucer. These are not real names. These are pseudonyms, um, which was given, which was handed down by a single judge of the uh, um, uh, Federal Circuit Court of Australia. It's now been renamed um, just about six months ago. Uh, the facts of the case, and these are important just to, to brief you, um, are that a father made an application to vary parenting orders in relation to his two children, a daughter um, 
known as Y, who is 11, and a son known as X, who was 10. Um, the previous parenting orders, the ones he wished to vary, um, had been in place for almost six years and had given uh, parental responsibility to both the mother and the father. However, the children had a live, a live with order, a residence order with the mother um, for at least nine days in the fortnight and with the remainder being spent with the father. In this case, the father argued that in the three months over lockdown, the mother had used COVID to prevent him from seeing his children. And the mother agreed that he, she had with, indeed withheld the children from visiting their father, but argued that she had a reasonable excuse. And she argued that the children had underlying health issues, including asthma, they were prone to chest infections. She also claimed that the father had not taken the COVID situation seriously enough and had sent the children to school while they were sick. And she also knew that he didn't socially distance when he went out in his, in his personal life. So she was very concerned. She also argued that the father, in any event, had always dismissed the health needs of their son, X, who had been diagnosed with a range of conditions. And she argued that over the lockdown, since they were, had to be homeschooling, that the father was not well equipped to be able to respond to the learning needs of their son. Another reason that she didn't, um, she withheld the children. So, um, this particular, no, sorry, back to this one. This particular um, paragraph captures, I think, the views about who, the judge's views, at least, about who's doing the care work. And it's not just in this situation, he's generalising it to all the mothers and fathers that he sees and uh, communicating also his, implicitly his views about it. So, um, he writes, I was also struck by the father's failure to accept the extent of excess difficulty. I observed that it's all too common in parenting disputes involving children with difficulties that the mother thinks that they are far worse and the father far less. And that is certainly the case here. So through the use of the word far, we're suggesting that, uh, I think the judge is suggesting that the father's is inappropriate, is too, is not careful enough, whereas the mother is too careful or too cautious. Um, communicating in that way what he thinks the appropriate standard of care might be. Um, in spite of the, in some ways, the judge recognising that the father has some, there are some doubts about his ability to care for the children. Um, in the next paragraph, um, he's quite dismissive of um, the mothers of the mother for having a negative view about the father because of that. So um, the next paragraph goes, the mother struck me as stru slightly strange. She was not prepared to admit that what, what is in fact patent, namely the extremely negative view she has of the father, which is, as I accept, however, in part derived from and reinforced by a lack of full understanding on the father's part of X's medical conditions uh, in particular. So although the judge appears to accept that the father can't meet the care needs of the children. The judge is not uh, accepting that the mother ought to let this affect her view of the father. Um, this mother's ne negativity towards the father is unreasonable. And as such, um, it's not, it can't be, the uh, judge implies, I think, here that it can't be the reason that the mother is reluctant to. Um, to share the time with the children, but actually it's because she doesn't, uh, she's um, anti-father. So she's just, just gonna resist time altogether. The medical needs actually don't form part of her, re her reason to withhold and in any event aren't legitimate, but rather it's her anti-father um, stance. So when the judge comes to weighing the importance of meeting the child's care needs versus the importance of maintaining a relationship with a father who perhaps can't meet for the care needs. Um, this is what he concludes. So he's, he writes, both of the parents have the capacity to provide for the physical needs of the children and the children have lived all their lives with their mother without any major difficulties. Both parents have deficiencies in respect to the children's emotional needs. Um, I'm not quite convinced that the father will be able to provide for X's intellectual needs given his shilly shallying as to the effects of his ODHD and his general underplaying 
of both difficulties with asthma. Now you'd think here at this stage, it's sounding pretty much like he's not gonna vary the orders. Um, certainly they have a different mix of capacities, but um, certainly the father's not coming out necessarily as the best placed person. But then the judge goes on to write this. Where the mother is more deficient, however, is in her capacity to provide for the children's needs in respect to their relationship with their father. And this becomes hugely significant in the case. And in fact, um, leads to quite an unusual outcome, which the judge himself recognises as unusual, which is to vary the initial orders and have not only the children live with the father, so to reverse it, and now the children are to live with the father for nine days of a fortnight and with the mother for the five. But the father is to have sole parental responsibility for the children in all spheres of their life, which is actually a very unusual outcome um, and often is only reflected in cases with very um, considerable circumstances of proven family violence. It's actually quite difficult to resist equal shared parental responsibility for a range of legal reasons. So um, I'm just wrapping up now. So of course, this is just one case. And although um, there are others, um, their themes are a little bit different, differently expressed and in a different mix. But this one case, I think, does demonstrate how the implications of failing to value care work, its invisibility generally means that it has an impact on family law disputes. It indicates that um, this line of inquiry of looking at how care work is valued made invisible, devalued in family law disputes and it um, is important and uh, a wider understanding of how it impacts on mothers and not just the benchmark mothers but also how this plays out in the context of the diverse forms of families that we have in Australia. Um, and I look forward to um, exploring those themes further in the other cases as I get through the very long list. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Anne. That was a really fascinating presentation. I think we don't, again, often think about the intersections of the Family Law Act when we're thinking about sort of paid work and unpaid work, but of course it impacts on so many families, so it makes sense to look at that intersection. So thank you. Um, and also you said at the beginning, you know, that you felt like you weren't looking at maybe as broad a definition of care after June Oscar's um, keynote address this morning, but in fact, I think you did sort of open up for us to think about other forms of care like emotional labor and organization in the household and of course the new shift i don't know if it's a third or the fourth shift of homeschooling that came with the COVID pandemic so thank you so we do have a number of questions from our um attendees participants so i'll just sort of go through these now the first one that came in marion i think is directed to you and I'm just going to add on to it a little bit. So Christy says um, that she agrees with you that daddy leave at minimum wage was difficult to take up and says, well, what's two weeks leave going to achieve? And I wonder if I can add to that by asking, is there a relationship between the length of time that fathers get at that initial postnatal stage with their babies and maybe their involvement then later on as more involved parents in unpaid care? And parenting yes of course um you know if there's longer leave um that encourages take up um if if men have leave while the babies are very small they're much more engaged with with their uh, children later on so it has you know that that very beneficial uh, consequence so there's a lot hanging on policy design you know working out the optimal policy design to encourage uh, shared parenting, um, you know, not only when the baby's just born, but, but you know, that will have consequences as the children grow. Hmm. Thank you. Linda, I think the next one is directed to you. So William asks, do you have any theories about why men's mental health continues to improve with more hours of work? Well, it improves up to a point, um, and the point depends on how much other work they're doing. So, um, the, the, the very you know, what the data shows is there is a tipping point. It's much milder for men, and I do have a theory about that. In fact, I have a paper about that. Um, but it does tip down. 
so and actually um, sadly for men the effect on BMI is much stronger than it is for women so I haven't shown that paper but actually it's interesting that the weight gain is higher for men. Um, well, I mean, work delivers power, it delivers status, it delivers money, it delivers social interaction, it delivers purpose. It's got a lot of goodies there. And um, so, you know, that, that's why, to some extent, having the capacity to contribute to society through work, just like the capacity to contribute to society through care, is a really important part of being human. So, yeah, there's some benefits, and there's some benefits depending where you are in the system and the privileges that, that your position offers you. So the benefits are there. Um, it is interesting that men are willing to work so long, if you like, without their mental health tipping. But back to why, well, we've just, I think it's published or it's just about to go out now, published a paper called Time for Physical Activity, Different unequal gendered and basically it's an analysis within a household of how time works and then puts the household in the labor market to show how time works it's very beautiful lovely econometrician tim Doan did all the modeling fabulous what he shows is that when men are in homes and their paid work their paid work actually controls women's time in a different way to how women's paid work controls men's time so effectively women adjust their time around men's paid work and men adjust their unpaid work around their paid work. So, so men basically have a flexibility with their unpaid work and with women's time. So women's time bumps up as their paid work time goes up, which women don't have. Their, their uh, paid work time makes very minimal difference to men's uh, pay, paid work time or unpaid work time. And they don't moderate their unpaid time, like those graphs, they just add it on. So women's time is rigid, men's time is flexible. And that's a beautiful illustration to me about how power, power and time is so meshed. Um, so when you work longer hours, you've got a lot more flexibility in your other demands, um, usually in general, um, which enables men to make more space for things that matter to them. So in this analysis, build the data, men's uh, physical activity was not affected by the long work hours once you took this into account. Women's is massively influenced by their paid work hours once you took it into account. So it's these transactions and that interplay between families and the labour market which really locks the system in. And while we continue to say if you want a good job, you've got to work your 50 hours or you won't get it or 60 hours, sometimes more, then we're rewarding that. We're locking that in through pay as well. Thank you. Um, William's follow-up question was about how we could go about actually limiting hours of work. And I know you did touch on enforcing the NES, um, sort of minimum hours. Yeah. So, so it's a, that's such a good question. And I, so I think, you know, I think, the, it, the difficulty of change is inverse to kind of the reflection of the power it embeds. So this is hard because it's so entrenched and it's so connected to power, not just gender power, but, but um, the power in capitalism. So you've got so much power bearing on extracting as much work as you can from someone um, in, in the labour market. And... Um, you know, I think that was nicely articulated, including in Margaret's um, presentation. So it's kind of like the fight over more pay. It gets pretty prickly when she's trying minute work hours. And um, so I think it's very difficult. On the other hand, lots of things in the labour market are difficult. And that's why we have national employment standards. And that's why we have work health and safety rules. And we have a whole lot of other things like that that we just do. They, were, they didn't come out of nowhere. They were a struggle, like the eight-hour day. But it just takes a huge amount of pressure and a willingness to make this happen. And we need to have that willingness nationally to make this happen. We, we, we continue to imagine women will be able to somehow jump into the labour market because they're as good as men and then succeed like men do. It just won't happen the way we've configured it or else we're envisaging a, the world of endless toil, which is what Margaret signalled. Mm. Yeah, so it sounds like there has to be some national 
discussion about these complex issues and that's probably aligns with Marion's call for a national overarching policy on gender equality. That yeah, but I mean, yeah, he, he, you've got some expertise, all of you here. I mean, we, we actually have legislation. How do you, you know, we enforce other legislations. Why aren't we doing it? Well, there might be some people listening in who have some ideas. <laughs> um, I'll just move on to, because we seem to be getting a lot of people interested. So Christy's asked, has research been done as to what evidence shows regarding the best interests of the child, read the time and quality of care they receive from adults, parents or otherwise? Does anybody want to take that question? I am happy to um, uh, respond um, not to preclude others as well. Um, as, there's quite a bit of research about, well, at least how the changes to the Family Law Act um, resulted in a change of uh, outcomes uh, for in post-separation dis family disputes. So certainly the 2004 six reforms were linked with an increase in the number of um, shared parenting uh, we can week about arrangements, particularly in the five to 11 year old age bracket. Um, however, the quality, as far as I know, at least, although I, I, I suspect there might be people here who, who know, um, the quality of that time, um, there's less information about. Um, there's always been a fair amount of criticism about this sort of this shift to an emphasis on shared parenting um, and its impact particularly on, on younger children. Um, and there is some real questions, but we haven't seen uh, any shift in the law just yet. So it, it remains as it is and the way that the best interests of the child um, is structured, we still have benefit of a meaningful relationship as a primary consideration, even if we do have a mix of other considerations that fall to be... Um, can I? Oh, sorry, Mary. We, uh, oh, no, you go. Mm. So there was a very beautiful book by Ellen Galinsky called Ask the Children. Um, and actually, that's what we need to do. And there's some great qualitative research on children's views of um, time with parents and parents' time. And what they tend to, what children tend to do is that their children are very pragmatic. They don't expect endless time with either the mother or their fathers, but they do expect to have their parents time with them um, and in particular times with their parents. So all, almost all the studies I've read have shown that children where parents were stressed and cranky and they don't want that time. Um, particularly with fathers, children have adapted to this understanding of fathers being preoccupied with work, but they have often had this idea of their time. And their time tends to be weekend time in particular, but they have time that they see as their time and they are distressed when they see that being encroached on. So children are quite discerning about time and it seems to be, uh, obviously it's gonna change with developmental age and adolescents, of course, um, would prefer no time, but um, you know, the, the, it, it, children are quite discerning about that. So I think, I think the question, the answer is, there's not a magic number here. I think it depends on what children are wanting, but also what they're seeing. And they are very discerning about the quality of time. Actually quite, really quite um, movingly, a lot of the research shows that children try and help their parents with their work so they get more time with them. And there's some very kind of beautiful quotes of children deliberately doing that, going, I'll help them so that they can then have more time for me. So they're quite, a, they're quite agentic as much as they can be in, in, in negotiating time with their parents. Did you want to add to anything to that, Marion, around children, best interests of children and time with their parents? Um, perhaps just a more general comment on time stress. I mean, I think this is um, one of the areas where you can show that actually public policy priorities make quite a difference. I mean, working hours, vary so much between countries and that's a result of public policy. So, um, you know, I do think that if one sets out clear policy priorities, one can take steps to, to reduce 
the kind of time stress that, that Lyndall's been talking about, which has such adverse effects on children. Mm. Thank you. I'll just add, so Belinda Smith um, from the University of Sydney has commented, so she's one of our uh, discrimination experts. She writes, my understanding of the NES hours maximum only regulates the line between regular and overtime hours. People work more hours because they can choose to do overtime and men are more likely to choose to for the reasons Lyndall has outlined, pay, status, identity. And this is also why efforts to legally limit work hours, e.g. France 35 max have struggled to be effective. And I think Anna Chapman has also written a paper about um, the provision in the NES around maximum weekly, a uh, reasonable overtime. Sorry, I'm not very au fait with the Fair Work Act, but the provision that deals with what constitutes reasonable overtime and what reasonableness means in that context. Yeah, I mean, I think so. that's correct um, in the sense that if there's, there's a reasonable reason and it, it comes back to what's that reasonable reason and whether that needs to be revisited. So, for example, is your workload a reasonable reason? Is holding on to your job or getting promoted or the fact that everyone else works 50 hours a reasonable reason? And there is this problem with time pay to excessive hours. So in the construction industry, um, um, I'm with a team of people who are trying to work with them to think about how they might reduce their work hours. Um, but 60 hour week is normal. Mm. But if you cut them, you cut pay because most of those, so what you've got is a system, right? So those men work, get over time. Those hours mean their wives or their partners can't work. So they've got one income. So they're right locked into it. It's not that they're happy with it, but they can't get out of this system. And if you cut the hours, you cut the pay and you then cut the family survival in terms of income. Mm. So that it, it, it is a problem in, under, in understanding who pays when you cut work hours. And the evidence is on reduced working week trials is you need a tripartite model. You need a model that's shared with employees, employers and government. That, that helps it stick. But to expect employees just to cop a massive pay cut because they've, if you like, been, been you know, if you like, and I actually think it's, it's a form of coercion, they've had to work the long hours to make a living wage, then you're asking them to no longer make a living for their family. So that, that is why we, when we, you know, back to Williams asked, how do you do it? Well, it does actually need a social conversation and it does need a social compact between um, um, in, in the individual, the workplace and the government um, to, to, to actually negotiate this. Mm -hmm. Most families who are working with these very long hours have accommodated to it. That is, the husband's not, or the, the man's usually not there, the wife doesn't have a job or a very minimal job that works around his hours. Yeah. For the future generations, that's not what, you know, if we stay that way, it'll stay that way. So, Lyndall, that provides a very good segue to the next question, you know, the idea around, well, cutting work hours is just cutting people's income. Um, but can I ask you, Lyndall, if you get a chance to pop in a reference to the chat function to everybody, um, to the paper that you referred to about men and women's physical time versus work time? Christy yeah. Barlow has asked for that. Yeah, I'll put in the, I'll put it in press, so I'll put, put in the citation. If you want to get a copy of the Impress article, just email me. Okay, thank you. And so the question from Celia Vukovic is, would any of the panelists like to comment on whether some of the issues that have been discussed during this session, women doing more unpaid care work than men, the invisibility of unpaid care work, not enough time in the working week to do paid work plus unpaid care work, would some of those issues be solved by unpaid care work becoming paid work, perhaps through something like a universal basic income? Who would like to go first? Marion, do you have any views on that? Not to drop you in it, you don't have to, but you have to. Um, well, I mean, I think universal basic income is a wonderful idea. Um, I can't see it happening in Australia in the, in the near future, unfortunately, but, um, you know, and I'm not sure that, that it resolves the issue of, of the sharing of, of um, 
the, the, the sharing of, of, of responsibility for, for um, care work, um, you know, it, it, it solves the problem of, of economic um, uh, e economic security for both men and, and women. So, I mean, that's one, you know, step towards gender equality. But I'm not sure that it that it that it resolves, you know, the the, the more equal sharing of, of of parenting and care work. Mm. Would it, Anne or Lindell, would you like to comment on that? You don't have to, but if you'd like to. Well, how will it change workhouse? And I, 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 I'm, I'm not against the idea, but how would it actually change having people work 50 hours a week regularly um, and people who, who don't or can't? Yeah. And, uh, and again, I'm not against uh, the idea of a universal basic income, but um, I'm not sure as well whether it would... Uh, necessarily, I mean, it might, but um, in and of itself value the unpaid care work that people do. I just had a, um, a look at the question and answer and I noticed that um, actually Belinda, hi Belinda, mentions um, what I think is, is would be a step, which would be to specifically work on changing notions around masculinity um, and how that fits with caring and in that broader sense, not just spending time and making decisions in a parenting context, but all the other stuff that comes with it that informs parenting and I think leads to better parenting um, more broadly. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, so I might read um, Belinda's question out. To change work hours and get care valued, do we need to focus on men and specifically notions of masculinity that reinforce men as independent and uncaring? Marion or Lindell, do you have a view about that? What? Well, that, that's what the image is around um, um, sharing the load were about, you know, promoting images of, 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 of masculinity involving caring for small babies. I mean, you know, you saw that from the 1980s in Australia and Sweden and, and more recently with, with these um, policy proposals for a redesign of our parental leave to, to, uh, to promote gender equality. It has to go together with, with that, you know, reimagining re of, 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 of masculinity clearly um, but the images themselves are not enough as we can see we had images in the 1980s but you know the policy didn't uh, didn't didn't eventuate which would support that kind of um, change in, in in masculine roles and you've got your hand up I was just going to make a comment about the images Marion, which I hadn't seen before and were really interesting and I'm glad you had them up. Um, it's a shame you didn't have the Swedish one though and it, but although the way that you described it, um, it reminded me of the, um, I suppose that fact that the more out, uh, paid work that women do, the more household work they tend to do and it's kind of this trade-off between if if you had a masculine a very I, I'm guessing a hyper masculine wrestler with lots of muscles cradling a baby it's almost sort of a trade-off between I can care but that doesn't take away from my traditional notions of what a, ma a man is or can do I'm not necessarily saying that that can't work as an image but I do think we need a more a, a, now I do think we need more diverse images and to break down well it's not like a if you're caring you can only do that if you're more manly like it needs to be a, a very a much more fundamental change around what we understand masculinity to. Hmm. Can I just add that um, one of the things I have felt really um, interested in is this whole idea of deficit discourse and i my view is that we have an, allowed feminism accidentally to slip into that or been pushed into that by sort of um, keeping the lens on women. Um, I do think we need to put the lens on men and start to 
instead of articulating women as if somehow not having things um, or not being able to do stuff, start to really push into um, seeing, seeing that actually problematizing, if you like, um, what's put up to be the standard for women to aspire to and, and valorizing um, what, what the kind of the, the things that women do actually do. And so I, I would agree absolutely that we, we do need to change the whole imagery around gender equality um, to move away from this catching up idea. Thank you. Um, I think we'll have to wrap up now because it's quarter to three and it's time for our afternoon tea break. But um, I'd like to thank all of the speakers for your very thought provoking um, presentations and for this discussion and for everybody who asked questions. Um, I feel actually very privileged to be part of this discussion with the three of you. So thank you very much. Um, there's one question, Anne, for you um, directly. So perhaps you could answer that um, in the break from Christy. Um, and I suppose I'd just like to make one final comment just quickly before we finish up in relation to the keynote address this morning, just something that keeps coming up for me today, which is that you know um, June's whole work was about bringing the voices of First Nations women and girls and as a starting point to then developing policies or reforms from that from their voices and their experiences and it just sort of seems to me like what everybody's sort of saying is we need a reframing of what we want contemporary family life to look like um, and what we want gender equality to look like and then adjust the institutions to that from you know starting from there rather than a top-down approach which I felt Lyndall a bit like the premier's um, shake up of school hours felt a bit like a top-down approach rather than really asking you know where we need to go so um, yeah, I hope we can sort of continue that discussion in our panel this afternoon. So I can see Sally's appeared and Sally's, Sally Moyle from the ANU is going to be chairing our panel this afternoon on the future of work. I think we come back for that at 3.15. Sally, did you want to say anything before we break for afternoon tea? No, but just prepare your questions because we've got a, we're hoping to have some, uh, shorter papers and longer conversations. So everybody looking forward to um, the, the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Sally, or I'll see everybody at 3.15. And thank you again to our speakers. And thank you, Emma, for wonderful sharing. Yeah, thank you.